We continue our study of the book of Genesis. We are, of course, studying the entire Pentateuch, all five books of Moses, and we are in Genesis chapter 42 this morning in the midst of the story concerning Joseph. And let me emphasize once again, if you can read the story of Joseph and not be moved, there's something wrong with you. I just, I'm just putting that out there. Because this story, it, 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 ha- it tugs at the heartstrings, uh, as you're going to see clearly once we get deep into it. But just the story of how this man overcame all these obstacles to get where he got is uh, a story that transcends any kind of genre, any kind of nationality, any kind of uh, society that you want to think about. Moses was a storyteller. I've said that time and again, and it's worth repeating. He can tell a story, and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so everything he writes is true. But he knows how to craft together something that will appeal to your emotions as well as appeal to your mind. And he's going to demonstrate that in all five books. He's demonstrating it clearly here in Genesis, how he can tell a story. But also he's going to demonstrate once we get to the law portions, uh, the strict law portions of the Pentateuch, how he can really, uh, in detail, uh, pen a constitution, as we would put it. Uh, A law for an empire, a law for a nation. He had been trained to do just that. And he's going to be demonstrating that as we go through. But here, in the midst of all of this, uh, Moses appeals to us. And he appeals in all the right reason, for all the right reasons. So chapter 42 begins, Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? That strikes me as funny. Now, it may not strike you as funny. It stri- always has struck me as funny. Just picture in your mind what Moses is showing us. The scene shifts back over to Canaan. And here we find Israel, Jacob, with his sons, and they're sitting in the tent. And all of a sudden, Israel says, why are you sitting there staring at each other? It's almost like you would see on a sitcom, you know. You're just sitting there looking at each other. Well, that's what Moses is trying to get across to us. The, the famine is so severe that they don't know what to do. They're perplexed. So Israel, Jacob, being a man that wants to solve the problem, is wanting to get at the heart of this and get food. And he knows the solution. So, verse 2, he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place so that we may live and not die. I've got your solution. Go down to Egypt, buy the food because we want to live. Then 10 brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid the harm may befall him. After all of these years, it's been, what, over 13 years since Joseph, uh, he thinks, has been killed. Of course, we know what really happened. But since Joseph had been taken from him, in those 13 years, Israel, Jacob, has been in mourning constantly. And his focus is now on his other son by Rachel. And he certainly doesn't want anything to happen to him as he thinks happened to Joseph. He wants to protect him. Joseph's full brother then stays behind there in Canaan. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Just as Joseph said, interpreting Pharaoh's dream, that this famine is going to be severe throughout all nations. Well, it happens just as he foretold. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Joseph was the ruler. As I mentioned before, and I'll say it again, this could not have happened if a full-blown Egyptian had been Pharaoh. 
Because Egyptians, those who were full-blooded Egyptians, would not allow foreigners to have any part in government. But as we pointed out, there was a period of time through two dynasties where there was a foreign dynasty that took control, the Hyksos. And it was during that period of time where Joseph could have been in this position. So he's second in command, only answerable to Pharaoh, as we saw in the previous chapter. He's the one fully responsible to sell grain. He's the one that has that authority. And then Moses tells us that when Joseph's brothers came to him, what's the first thing they do? They bow down to him. Do you remember what Joseph had told his brothers all the way back when he was 17 years old about the dream he had? I dreamed that you would bow down before me. Now that's coming true. What God had put in his dream, because God was responsible for it, now is fulfilled. Verse 7. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But... He disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Now, what Moses does here is something that any good writer will do, aside from the fact of being inspired by the Holy Spirit. A good writer is not going to reveal all the information right at the first. He's going to reveal certain information as the story moves to make his dramatic points. Well, what Moses is doing is he's telling us the general parameters of what's going on, but as we're going to see later in the text, he's going to reveal some more things he doesn't reveal here. Some other things are going on that explains fully what's happening. For once, or for one thing, and I'll go ahead and reveal this, Joseph is speaking through an interpreter. He's not speaking directly to his brothers. How do we know that? Because Moses says it. Later in the text, he reveals that he had an interpreter. So what Joseph is doing, Joseph is speaking in the Egyptian language to his brothers, actually through the interpreter. He understands fully what they're saying. They have no idea what he's saying because he's speaking in a foreign language. Another thing, he recognizes his brothers Remember, he's several years younger than his brothers in age. So his brothers, at this point, had not changed that much in their looks and their appearance. He recognized them immediately. But think about this. It's been 13 years since his brothers have seen Joseph. They remember Joseph as that 17-year-old teenager, possibly very skinny. We're not told by Moses about his physical stature. We have to assume he was a lot thinner then than he is at this point. He also is not nearly as sunburned or sunbeaten as he is by being out in Egypt and exposed to the sun constantly. He's also physically fit. He's also 30 years old. A man looks different when he's 30 than he does when he's 17. We know that, normally speaking. And that was the case with Joseph. So his physical stature had already changed. Perhaps he's grown taller since he was 17 years old. We're not told completely by Moses. We have to assume. But one thing we can know is that because of Joseph's position, being second in command over all of Egypt, he was dressed in Egyptian finery. We know that because of what Pharaoh had put on him. All of the symbols of Egyptian authority. So he has the Egyptian clothing on. We have to assume that he had some kind of facial makeup, being an, or, uh, an, uh, or second in command over all the nation of Egypt. So all of that factors into this where Joseph's brothers don't recognize him. They don't say, that's Joseph. They don't say that because he doesn't look like he did. So that's a factoring into this. He recognizes them. They didn't recognize him. Verse 9 then says, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them. Joseph remembers. When they bow down to him, first thing he thinks of, that dream that he had about them bowing down to him. And said to them, you are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Now that's a quite natural charge of Egyptian officials against foreigners. 
And that's quite natural in many nations of the world when they have somebody coming in who is a foreigner, who they don't know, who they suspect. What did they say? You're a spy. We're going to put you in confinement. Well, that's what Joseph does to further the disguise that he has from them so they don't recognize him. And another reason. Joseph is beginning to test his brothers. He wants to know, have his brothers changed? Have they changed at all in their character? But there's another reason. He wants to find out if his father's still alive, and he wants to find out if his younger brother's still alive. Remember, last time Joseph has seen his brothers, they threw him into a pit. He had no idea that one brother was intended to come back and rescue him from the pit. He thought all 12 brothers were in on it. And he naturally, I'm thinking, thought in those 13 years since, what happened to Benjamin? If they did that to me, what are they going to do to Benjamin? So he's wanting to find out those two things. All of that's playing out as we read this. Verse 10, then they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We all are sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. They're defending themselves naturally against this false charge in their eyes. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. He insists. He's still testing them. But they said, your servants are 12 brothers in all. Hmm. The sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, here's the kicker as far as Joseph is concerned. The youngest is with our father today. And one is no longer alive. That answers Joseph's burning question. Is his father still living? Yes. Is Benjamin still alive? Yes. Those two things now he's found out. But more, more so, verse 14, Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. He's still presenting himself as this harsh Egyptian official. He's still presenting that persona to them, and he wants to see for his own eyes how Benjamin's doing. Yes, Benjamin's alive, but is he being treated with respect? Is he being treated with uh, the respect that he needs and deserves? And deserves. Has he been injured in any way by his brothers? Perhaps all of that was going through his head. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you, but if not by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Now think of the irony of this. His brothers who had thrown him into a pit wanting him to die are now put in prison by that brother whom they thought that they had killed. When a man's in prison, it has a sobering effect on him. I've never been in prison, never intend to be, but I've known people who have been and it is sobering. It will cause you to rethink all that you've done and the true character of a man will come out. That's what Joseph, I'm sure, knows. If I put them in prison for three days, we're going to see. We're going to see the true character of these men now. Have they really changed, or are they still the same violent, uh, godless men that they were the last time that I saw them? Verse 18. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live. For I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go, carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified, and you will not die. And they did so. So now Joseph has been playing the bad cop. Now he's playing sort of the good cop. 
he's easing off on them. Oh, okay, we'll let you go back and bring your brother. You know, you can be released from the prison now. So now he's going to see what they're going to say. Then they said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. In other words, his brothers are saying, we have reaped what we're sowing, what we have sown. We are reaping what we've sown. What we did then has come back to bite us now. We ignored his pleading. Think about it. Joseph, a 17-year-old boy, thrown in that pit, pleading for his life, pleading that he would be rescued. And they ignored him. But then Reuben pipes in, verse 22. Reuben answered them saying, did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy and you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. Reuben, the oldest, he says, I told you. I told you what was going to happen. All of that is now rehashed by all the brothers. Watch this. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood for there was an interpreter between them. Moses drops that little fact right here. That's how they have not been able to understand that this is not an Egyptian, that this is a Hebrew, because number one, Joseph's speaking Egyptian. He's learned it in the 13 years he's been there. And number two, he's speaking through an interpreter. This interpreter knows uh, Hebrew, and he's able to speak to the brothers. So they don't know that he's understanding what they're saying. And now watch this. He turned away from them and wept. I can't read that without it moving me. After 13 years, Joseph overhears his brothers talking about it. And he can't help it. He cries. Turns away and cries. That's moving. And Moses intended for it to be moving. But that's not it as far as the tugging at your heartstrings. There's more to come, I guarantee you. But this right here indicates, well, at least they've changed concerning me. But have they really changed? He's still not completely convinced yet. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Now we have to understand that he had Simeon bound. That is, Joseph did not physically bind Simeon. He had one of his servants do that because later on we're going to be told by Moses that there were Egyptian servants there in Joseph's house and there were those that would assist him. So when Joseph bound Simeon, his assistants did that for him physically. But he had Simeon to be bound. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And thus it was done for them. You see what Joseph's doing here? Not only is he filling their sacks with grain, he also tells the assistants, put back the money that they paid. Joseph's going to see if his brothers have really changed? Are they going to keep that money? What's their reaction going to be when they discover this? Thus it was done for them. Verse 26, So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money. And behold, or Moses would say, surprise, that's the word, behold, is surprise. It was in the mouth of his sack. He opens up his food sack and right there at the top, that money. Then he said to his brothers, my money has been returned, behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank. And they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? They can't understand it. They cannot understand. They've been accused of spying. One of their brothers is now being held in Egypt until they can bring Benjamin back with them. And on top of everything else, 
the money is in the sack of one of the brothers. Oh, that's not it, though. There's going to be more developing, as we see in the next few verses. When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your households, and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will give your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. So they recount to him exactly what's happened. But now watch what takes place. Now it came to pass about as they were emptying their sacks that behold, Moses, surprise, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. They are now open, wide open to the charge of thievery. They have no idea how this happened. All they know is the money's there. So, their father Jacob said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. He says, Joseph's no more. Simeon is as good as dead. That's what he's saying. Simeon is as good as dead, being there in Egypt. And now you're wanting to take Benjamin? I've already lost one son, about to lose a second. You're wanting me to lose a third. That's Jacob's thought process. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, you may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Now, we add right here that as patriarch, Israel had that right under patriarchal law. He had the right to do that if the situation arose. And Reuben volunteers this. Put him in my care and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you. Notice Jacob says, my son. He still has that difference. He still makes that difference between Joseph and Benjamin and the rest of his boys that he did 13 years ago. If, uh, and he alone, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol and Sar. You're going to bring me down to the grave. You're going to pull me down to the grave. How many times have parents said something like that in jest, perhaps, or in maybe half serious to their children? You're going to drive me to an early grave. That, well, that's, in essence, what Jacob's doing, yes. Yes, be the death of me yet, exactly. Sheol being the realm of the dead. So you're going to be the death of me. You're going to kill me the way that you're wanting me to do this. So that sets up everything that's about to fully develop. Uh, any questions or comments before we get into chapter 43? Yes. Yes, yes. He said they have a disgust for shepherds, and that's very true. Uh, they had a very caste mentality, in other words, a social class mentality. You look at the way it is in India at present, where you have the caste system, e Egypt was all about that. Egypt was all about the caste system, on top of the fact that they uh, had a preference by far for native-born Egyptians. So all that was working against in theory, working against uh, the brothers, uh, the sons of uh, Israel. So yeah, there's all this playing out that Je Moses doesn't go into great detail about, but is behind the scenes, yes. Absolutely. Jacob is familiar with how Egyptians operate. And even though this is a dynasty that is not Egyptian a native Egyptian dynasty, they still are harsh, uh, have that reputation. And so he knows that since they're foreign-born, they're not going to have preference, even if this is a foreign-born 
dynasty, they assume, uh, another thing uh, working in with this, Joseph's brothers assume that Joseph is an Egyptian, which I think is interesting. It's interesting they assume he's Egyptian. He, he plays that part well. So even though you've got uh, foreigners on the throne that's ruling over Egypt, you've got native-born Egyptians that are still in key positions. And they're assuming that Joseph is one of those. So yes, Jacob had every, every uh, reason to be terrified of the situation as it stood. Uh, so this is, a, this is a very dramatic situation that's already developed, and they have no idea where this is going. Yes, absolute, Pharaoh had all power. He was the God on earth. He was uh, the God of the sun, God of the moon, the representative of him. He had the power of the gods, they would say. And uh, the vizier, the grand vizier, was the one that was the power often behind the throne. He was the one that executed all the dirty work for Pharaoh. When Pharaoh had somebody to be put to death or Pharaoh wanted something to be done, he would turn to his grand vizier and have it done. So that's the position that Joseph is in. He has total authority except to Pharaoh. That's the ultimate position. Uh, and normally... Egyptians on the throne in those positions would exercise that authority with impunity. Uh, but they've got a good man in this position. And it's going to be uh, coming out pretty quickly how good Joseph is. So, chapter, chapter 43, yes, sir. Sir? I say, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, why Simeon? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Why Simeon is the question that was asked. Well, that's a good question. Well, Reuben wasn't there, right? Reuben was gone. Simeon, by being second oldest, would have been the one in charge of his brother. When the time came to sell Joseph into slavery. Very true. So, even Joseph Reuben, you see again, acknowledges that fact. He said, did I not tell you he was gone? And now we see Joseph was the one who was in charge. He was the one who sold him to prison. That's a good point. That's a very good point. I appreciate that tremendously. Uh, he knew what he was doing. Joseph knew what he was doing when he put Simeon in, uh, in charge of them and uh, sent them on their way. So yes, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, all of this is playing out. All of this is playing out. And uh, they have no idea where it's going. So, we get in chapter 43. It says, now the famine was severe in the land. Moses emphasizes that point again. He's stressing it, that this famine is no ordinary famine. Just as Joseph had foretold when he interpreted that dream of Pharaoh, it is severe. Now, so it came about when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. Judah spoke to him, however, saying, the man solemnly warned us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. This is indicative of the fact that this has been an ongoing discussion between Israel and his sons ever since they've returned from Egypt. They're saying again, he told us. We can't go back unless we've got Benjamin. He's insisting Benjamin's not going. And they're saying, he's not going to see our face unless we've got Benjamin with us. Then Israel said, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? Israel sees the dilemma. He sees the predicament. Now he's complaining. <laughs> why did you say? <laughs> why did you tell him that you had another brother? But they said, the man questioned particularly about us and our relatives. Now, wait a minute. Moses didn't say anything about this in the previous chapter, did he? No. But he's revealing it to us through the mouth of the brothers now. Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we know now that among the questions that Joseph asked through his interpreter were, is your father still living and do you have another brother? He asked those questions particularly. So there's that little detail that Moses didn't tell us at the first. He's now revealing to us now. 
So he answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your brother down? All we did is answer his questions. We didn't know what he was going to say in response to us. They're pleading their case with him. Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. We as well as you and our little ones. Now, he calls his youngest brother, Benjamin, a lad or a young boy. At this point, Benjamin is 13 years older than he was when Joseph was taken away in Egyptian slavery. So that makes Benjamin in his early 20s. He's not a little boy anymore. But in comparison to all of his brothers, he is. In comparison to Joseph, he is still a little boy. He's the baby brother. You know, when you're a baby brother, you're going to be the baby brother no matter how old you get. I know that from experience. I'm the baby of the family of two. And I'm always going to be that way. Well, Benjamin's always going to be the lad, the boy, the kid. And so that's the way that uh, Joshua, or that, not, but, uh, that uh, 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 well, Judah <laughs> refers to him. So he says, send him with me. Verse 9, I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. We see in this man Judah, by what he says here, that he has truly, truly changed. What a change of heart for him. At the first, he was right in with that plot to sell Joseph into slavery. And then he does what he does that Moses describes for us in subsequent chapters, indicating that he was just worldly minded at one point. But then all of that happened with Tamer. And it changed him. It changed him. And he's now gotten older. He now realizes that there's more to life than just satisfying the physical desires. He knows that he's got to be right with God. And so this is demonstrated by what he says here. I'll be the one responsible for Benjamin. Put it on my shoulders. For if we had not delayed, he adds, surely by now we could have returned twice. <laughs> I love it. He says, if we had not put this off, we could have been down there already. It could have been down there two times. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags and carry down to the man as a present a little balm and a little honey, aromatic gum and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Ah, just a little gift. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's a big gift. <laughs> that's, that's a big gift. It's worth some money. Jacob knows what he's doing. You know, he's his father's son, who is his father's son, that they know how to be cordial and respectful and courteous and gregarious. So he's sending on this gift. Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned to the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. So Israel, Jacob, makes practical, effective preparation. He says, let's get this ready for this trip. Let's make sure you have everything in place before you go. Take your brother also and arise, return to the man. And may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man so that he will release to you your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. You can hear the resignation in his voice. If I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. If I lose my boys, I lose my boys. Let's go ahead and take this. Take Benjamin and try to bring them back to me. So the men took this present and they took double the money in their hand and Benjamin. Then they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. Once again, they are in Egypt. Once again, they're standing before their brother who they don't recognize. They don't know it's Joseph. They still don't. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he knows who Benjamin is. 
He said to his house steward, Bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. Joseph's got something else up his sleeve. He's got another test he's going to put before them. So the man did as Joseph said and brought the men to Joseph's house. Now, the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we are being brought in. Then may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves with our donkeys. It was a well-versed belief among those that knew how these things operated that if an official of a government was going to execute a sentence, that he would more likely do it at his home than he would in the temple court or in the palace. In other words, they thought what he's doing is he's setting us up to actually take us all in prison or take us all in as slaves. So they're terrified. They don't know what's about to happen. So they came near to Joseph's house to and spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. And it came about when we came to the lodging place that we opened our sacks and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full. So we have brought it back in our hand. We have also brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He said, now this is the assistant to Joseph. This isn't Joseph speaking because they're talking to Joseph's house steward. He said, be at ease. Other translations say, peace to you. Peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Can you believe this? They would be thinking among themselves. The brothers would be stunned. You had our money this whole time? And this just appeared and it's from God? Then he brought Simeon out to them. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys fodder. Every courtesy that could be given to a guest is being given to these brothers. So they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that they were to eat a meal there. So as they are waiting for Joseph, they take the present that Israel has sent and they're making sure it is presentable, no pun intended, presentable for Joseph when he arrives. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present which was in their hand and bowed to the ground before him. Once again, they bow before Joseph, fulfilling completely that dream that he had about his brothers. Then he asked them about their welfare and said, Is your old father well of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. They bowed down in homage. Once again, a third time, they bowed down before Joseph. Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, as he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, may God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. I've got five exclamation points by that verse. I think about this moment. I think about this moment when he has the word from his brothers that his father's still alive and he's well. And then he spies his youngest brother, he recognizes him immediately, and asks if this is Benjamin. They say yes. And he just is overcome. He's overcome. Joseph is moved completely by this. Not only is Benjamin alive and well, Israel is alive and well. Jacob is alive and well. And he just bawls like a baby. Bawls like a baby. 
If that doesn't move you, if something doesn't move within you when you read that, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Verse 31, then he washed his face and came out. And he controlled himself. I love the understatement that Moses uses when he's describing this. Joseph controlled himself. It took every ounce of control, I'm sure, for Joseph not to say, I'm Joseph, I'm alive. But he controlled himself because he had one more test or a couple of more tests that he wanted them to pass before he was willing to fully reveal who he was. And said, serve the meal. So they served him by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. Moses makes his comment here. It's a social taboo for Egyptians to eat with non-Egyptians. That tells us clearly that Joseph's brothers thought that Joseph was an Egyptian. And Joseph was playing that part to the hilt. As grand vizier, he could eat by himself and did, even in his own house. His servants ate by themselves. And then these sons, these brothers of his, ate by themselves. Now, they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men looked at one another in astonishment. The brothers of Joseph are looking at each other. How could he know who, how old we are? How did he know our ages? And yet, he's got it situated from oldest to youngest. How did he know that? They're completely astonished. He took portions to them from his own table. Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with them. That is a test. He's giving Benjamin far more than they're receiving. He's watching them to see how the brothers are going to react. The way they treated me 13 years ago, have they really changed? Have they really changed? Are they going to do to Benjamin or treat him the way they treated me? That's playing out. All of this is playing itself out. So when we get to chapter 44 next week, it's just going to be amazing. Amazing. I just, I just never can, I can't read I can't read this, the latter part of this story with, with complete objectivity. I can't detach my emotions from it. I just can't because it's so moving to me as it was to all Israelites that read it, as it still is to the Jews today who revere the story of Joseph along with the story of Esther. They love it and we can see easily why. It's an inspiration to us today as much as it was to them in those days. So that's where we'll be next week, chapter 44.